everyone. Today we're recording an oral history. Today is January 9th, 2018. Um, we are in New York, New York at the apartment of Mr. Lawrence Abrams. So thank you so much for agreeing to speak with us, first of all. Um, this oral history came about following a donation that you made to FIT Special Collections and also the museum at FIT last year in 2017. Um, and a large portion of the materials, not all, but a large portion of the materials that you gave to us in Special collections actually pertaining to the work of your mother, correct. Miriam Abrams. Um, she was Miriam Aaron at one point also, correct? First marriage. First marriage, right. Um, and she was a fashion designer on 7th Avenue for many, many years. So we're hoping today that you will tell us a little bit more about your mother and her career. My pleasure. Uh, my mother, Miriam Abrams, was a fashion designer for 50 years. She was born in New York City, December 5, 1910. From an early age, she was very creative and always drawing. In high school, she studied at the Art Students League, and at the age of 16, she graduated high school and entered Pratt and studied commercial art, but she did not like it, so she transferred to Cooper Uni for Fine Arts. Uh, in your archives is a medal of merit that she won, and she won many prizes for painting. Uh, just before the Depression, her father and his brother lost their girls' children coat business, and my mother had to go to work to help support the family. Uh, since she had been around fashion all her life and designing as a young girl for her father's company, she decided to enter the fashion business. In 1928, she became a sketch sketcher for Billy Gordon at $20 a week. She was so talented from the beginning, she was designing. In your archives are sketches from her designs for Mr. Gordon uh, that were produced. Her first outfit that she designed for him was a black velvet pair of pants, wide leg, with a white chiffon, all pleated bodice and sleeves mm -hmm. with a jeweled belt. And also she designed, almost like sportswear, not realizing it at the time, an all bias black velvet skirt so you interchanged. It became a big seller for the company. May I ask you a question? Yes. Um, Billy Gordon, he's a manufacturer, correct? No. He, no well, uh, he was a couture, couturier. Mm -hmm. uh, he... Um, designed custom-made clothing. He had a large following of uh, wealthy women and people in the theater and the opera. But he also was a model maker for manufacturers, yeah. mass production, so you have dual couture versus ready to wear. Right. And that's such an interesting story throughout the history of fashion. That, yeah. That uh, almost yeah. all these businesses, even the House of Worth was playing both sides. Yeah. 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 So. yeah. Um, No, it's all right. Okay. Uh, I have to find. I'm going to show you some of her uh, early, if I can find them. Ah, here they are. Oh, wait. Early 1930s sketches. These were work sketches. That's lovely. As you can see, some are day wear, but a lot of evening wear. In the archives, you have the original uh, drawings. These are photocopies I made to keep for myself. Um, within a short time, my mother was designing exclusively for both the couture department and the model making for Seventh uh, Avenue and Broadway houses. Uh, within a few months, she, her salary was increased to $50 a week, which was quite a sum in the late 20s. One of, um, within, uh, 
Uh, at the same time, she was learning how to drape and couture uh, construction. After sketching a dress and a fabric was chosen, a muslin was made to perfect the perfect cut and fit before cutting into expensive fabric. She also discovered that fabric could be an inspiration for an outfit. She also learned that certain fabrics were good for draping, such as crepe, and was also very good for cutting on the bias for slinky evening gowns, which was in vogue in the th uh, early 30s. Uh, fabric dictates the shape you can achieve. At the same time, she was learning the proper facings and linings and finishings needed to achieve a perfect garment and for the perfect shape you were trying to get. Fit, cut, and proportion are the most important thing in a garment. And that she learned at the very beginning, and this throughout her career was paramount and probably the main reason that she was so successful for 50 years. Billy Gordon was on 56th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue. He had a custom salon for wealthy women and a large following of people in show business. He also was a model maker for Broadway and 7th Avenue, uh, designing their lines for them that didn't have designers. Uh, mother worked in both custom and mass production, couture, construction, and volume manufacturing were an influence for her entire career. In the early 1930s, there were two main lines a year, fall and summer, spring rather, spring, summer, and something called tea gowns. Every line included tea gowns, which were long dresses that were worn in late afternoon. Then women would change into an evening gown to go out. This persisted for a part of the 30s, but the main lines were just two lines a year. Uh, Billy Gordon was a big believer in American designers and was a great promoter of them. He believed that American talent was as good as Paris. He organized American designers to show their collections to the press together with a large fashion show each season. He was also the first to promote American creativity and gave prizes to top designers, pre-Eleanor Lambert, pre-anybody. In the archives is a magazine, Mode, American Design, July, August, 1932. Page 40 is an article, I'll show you, which it, so you can see Billy, there's a photograph of him. The top portrait picture is a, my mother's boss, Billy Gordon. Uh, Francis Sinnott Blow was his boyfriend. The article is called The Importance of Being Earnest, and it details the change in clothing since the Depression, what women demanded. Also, that at the time, they were just starting to do what they do today, and every designer complains about pre doing lines pre-seasonal. You start six months before the clothes go into the store. And of course, even then, everybody was complaining like they do today. And it hasn't really changed, because you need the time to prepare, buy fabrics, get your patterns, your production going. But it is too early. But it's a conundrum. Um, uh, on page 16 shows designs. Uh, These were the top designers of the day, and designers he was giving opportunity to win prizes. Again, this was a first. Uh, Eleanor Lambert came along shortly after this period as a PR woman. He was not really a PR person. He was promoting talented designers. Uh, also, uh, on page 28 and 29 are four designs drawn 
and designed by my mother for Billy Gordon. Also in this magazine is a photograph of Elsa Scaparelli. And if you notice, remove the furs, you could wear the suit today. Absolutely. There are also two photographs of Joan Crawford in costumes from her movies. And th these are very famous uh, gowns that still are, appear in most textbooks. And right across from it is an article written by Elizabeth Hawes, I'd like to point out. Yeah. This dress, worn by Joan Crawford in one of her movies, was mass-produced for the first time for Macy's and then distributed throughout the United States and sold 500,000 copies. This was Adrian's first taste of ready-to-wear. He didn't manufacture them, but it was his design. In 1941, he was let go from the studio and his wife, Janet Gaynor, the actress, financed him in his own ready-to-wear business. He also still did some uh, commissioned work for actresses in movies, but he was no longer associated with uh, the movie industry. Uh, in the archives are 1932 fashion show programs uh, held at the Plaza Hotel promoting American talent. You will see Billy Gordon's house model was 21-year-old Lucille Ball. She was a platinum blonde, a la Jean Harlow, who was the rage at the time. There is also newspaper editorials with photos of Miss Ball modeling gowns designed by my mother, 1932. This is the original, one of the original newspaper editorials. Mm -hmm. You have this in your yes, archives. Mm -hmm. I, she obviously was proud, so she kept duplicates. <laughs> Mr. Gordon had a talent for picking young talent and ha hiring them to design for him and learn. Uh, many became very successful years later. Shannon Rogers for Jerry Silverman worked for him. Harry Schachter, who was the partner and designer for Ben Zuckerman in the coat and suit house, worked for him. Uh, by 1930, Hattie Carnegie was after my mother. Uh, her salon was one block away on 57th between 5th and 6th to go to work for her, but my mother did not want to leave Mr. Gordon. She did when Billy Gordon went out of business and he moved to California in late 1932. My mother did not want to work for Connie because she didn't pay well and manufacturers paid much better. But she gave in. She worked for her for a short time, but out of working uh, there, she made a lifelong friend of Norman Norell, who was one of the top designers for Hattie Carnegie. My mother had an influence on Norell. She wore and designed, since the late 20s, long skirts in taffeta or satin with a silk or chiffon blouse pleated and tucked, and or a wool turtleneck for evening uh, for herself and she designed this for Hattie Carnegie. This was an influence on him, and he, from the 1930s until his death in 72, he always incorporated blouses with skirts for evening or day wear. Okay, FIT's uh, museum has my mother's 
1941, archival number 2017-813, trainer Norell, red silk pleated blouse with a long black taffeta skirt, and it came with a purple cummerbund. Um, after leaving Miss Carnegie, my mother worked on 7th Avenue uh, for better houses and on Broadway for volume houses. At the time, fa uh, fashion house Mary Lee, who later became Adele Simpson, was one of my mother's first uh, jobs out of Billy Gordon and uh, Hattie Carnegie. Uh, in those days, designers were contracted to work for a manufacturer for three months to complete a line. Very few designers had full-time jobs. Uh, in the, your collection are three contracts, 1936 for Phil Zahn and Company at 1400 Broadway for $175 a week, 1936 Weingarten Dress, 525 7th Avenue at $150 a week, 1937 Parisian Manufacturing Company, 1400 Broadway for $200 a week. Some man, at this time, income taxes were started. Many of the manufacturers paid under the table so you didn't have to declare your taxes. Others wouldn't do this. Also, being contracted, Certain manufacturers insisted you work that season exclusively for them. Others would let you design for as many houses as you could get a job with. In 1936, my mother worked for the first time for Casino Dress in 537th Avenue. They were a better price house and were one of the top fashion houses of the day. Within, uh, within time, she worked exclusively for them until 1942 when her boss was drafted into the service for World War II when the firm was closed. They were known as a tailored, for tailored clothing and soft draped dresses of the day. They made dresses, suits, costumes, coats, and some evening wear. In the archives are three notebooks, 1940, 41, 42, of her entire collections. All sketches were manufactured. There are also store ads, Vogue and Harper ads, and promotional booklets of her designs. My mother was well known for her draped dresses, and one was inspired by a twist in a shoe. It became the inspiration for a deep V-neck gown with twisted drape at the waist. It retailed for $50. Uh, it was also made short before the long gown. Her boss said if she had received a commission on each dress sold, she would, be, would have been very wealthy. It was the most copied dress of the time, and it's still being made today. Here is uh, a Vogue ad for 1942 showing the dress, the one on the right-hand side, the draped one. Mm -hmm. Here is my mother's sketch. She made the dress when she worked for Youth Guild in the 1960s, the same dress. The difference, you can see a flared skirt, but it's the same dress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a salad. It, it continued to be, uh, it's very flat, body flattering, and it also conceals flaws in a woman's figure. Yeah. It's covering the tummy. You will also see, uh, she, my mother was also very well known for designing suits. She was v equally good at designing day wear evening wear, tailored clothing, soft clothing, which most designers are not. You generally find designers can design evening wear exclusively, tailored suiting exclusively. They don't overlap. Uh, 
one of her greatest successes was that she was able to design basically all types of clothing. Also, you find many designers that have become famous at certain periods throughout the history of the manufacturing that design a certain garment that becomes highly popular and they become very famous. But when styles change, they can't change with the times, which my mother was able throughout all 50 years to change as fashion changed. You will also find a, a collection from 1940 of French couture sketches, uh, which were inspirational because still, Paris was considered the ultimate. That hasn't even changed to this day, basically. They run to see what's being done in Paris. Um, in 1945, my mother was called by Nat Abelson of Ginsburg and Abelson, or Young Viewpoint, a half-size firm in 1400 Broadway. My mother left 7th Avenue for a half-size firm and remained there until 1961. Would you elaborate a little bit for us what exactly you mean by half sizes? Yeah, that I'm coming to Great. that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, half sizes were a five foot four and under, short waisted and heavy. A petite at that time was a woman five foot four and under, short waisted, but normal weight, not heavy. A junior was also basically the same thing, but thin. It's changed over the years. But basically, again, it was for heavier women. Um, uh, in 1945, half sizes were house dresses and very dowdy without any style or fashion. They were the forgotten woman. They would say, Oma Kayam, the tent made, maker, made the clothes. Mr. Abelson wanted to change this and wanted young Missy styling, and he wanted my mother. She agreed to work for him. After the first season, they were the leading style house for women, and by the early 1950s, they were doing the unbelievable volume of $15 million a year. Uh, major stores were now opening separate, better-priced departments for half sizes. There was a great demand from women for stylish clothing, and retailers realized there was a lot of money to be made by catering to these women. Uh, the women wanted youthful styles that were well-made and fit, fit prim primarily, which is the most important thing, no matter what size you're making, but it's what determines your success is your fit. Uh, My mother could not work on large mannequins, so all her samples were size eight. Uh, from the late 1940s to 1960, the firm had three in-house models who all samples were fitted on. When the buyers came in, they would show the line to the buyers, uh, something that can't be done today, too expensive. Uh, there are photos of, of a Christmas party taken in the mid-50s with my mother and a group of salesmen and models in your collection. My mother introduced seasonal fashion shows with famous commentators such as Arlene Francis, Virginia Graham, and Betty Furness as moderators. My mother's uh, design as, my, mother's des my mother designed as if the women were not large. She knew that certain necklines and cuts flattered a full figure and had figure flaws, but they could still be flattering and stylish. To make some uh, sure that her designs were not ruined or changed when duplicated, duplica duplicates were made, she worked with the production department uh, on the dupl duplicates and the fitting of the garments on a model to make sure that they were perfect. At the time, and still today, manufacturers take a sample from a sample room, put it into production, and they try to cut costs 
by simplifying a garment and in many cases destroying the design completely to get it out. She made sure this never happened and she had learned this in the beginning when she was doing couture clothes and fittings. And so wherever she went, part of her success was to de demand and they agreed to let her be in there when they went into production. My mother introduced new fabrications for large women as silks, satin, taffeta, velvet, lace, chiffon, embroideries, nail head embroideries, menswear fabrics for suiting, knits, ruching, pleats, tucking, combos of wool and satin, draping on uh, the back of a dress for style, uh, tunics, cap sleeves, and ultimately by the late 50s and 60s, sleeveless dresses and mock turtlenecks. Uh, she designed the chemise pre-Balenciaga in 1958. The secret of a flattering chemise is that it hangs straight and loose from the shoulder. The dress must lightly touch the hips, thighs, and knee in order for it to look good when in motion. Again, many manufacturers just cut them straight and they looked like sacks and they were not flattering. But again, when Balenciaga came out with the, which was called the sack originally, which was a chemise, and it, the 1920s, most of the dresses were wasteless, so it's not as if it was a new uh, creation completely. It became the predominant silhouette onward. Again, in the 60s, they did an A-line. They did it princess high, fitted around the bust, and then flaring out from the hips. But it's still a wasteless dress, which, again, camouflages multitudes of sins on a figure. The, you know, everyone is not a model. <laughs> Young Viewpoints clothes sold in the Northeast, Midwest, South, Ca South California, and uh, the Northeast. Different areas needed different fabrications, as in the South, women wanted light fabrics and bright colors. In the Northeast and West, there were cold winters, so coats and wools were needed. In the Northeast, people like dark colors, like in New York, black is popular. You go around the rest of the country, you don't see people wearing all black. Uh, so my mother had to work on very large lines each season to please the different sections of the country. My mother worked with two assistants, Rose Brown, who had been with her since 1935, and Ruth. She worked with 16 to 18 sample hands. By the 1950s, there were many more lines needed, such as fall, holiday or cruise, which was Christmas parties, and women, wealthy women took cruises, so they needed lighter clothes, not heavy winter clothes. Spring, summer, and transition. Transition was cottons but dark colors leading into fall. The lines uh, consisted of day wear dresses, suits, costumes, coats, and cocktail dresses. The firm worked with top retailers of the day. In New York, their biggest account was Lord & Taylor's Manhattan Shop, Washington, D.C., Garfinkel's, California, I. Magnans, Chicago, Marshall Fields, and Texas, Neiman Marcus and many specialty stores and other department stores throughout the United States. My mother was asked many times to appear on television, and she did only once in the early 50s, the Kate Smith Show. Kate Smith was a singer and uh, is known for her song, God Bless America. But my mother's boss was not happy because he claimed to be the designer. <laughs> in the 1950s and even in the 60s, Designers never got credit. They were backroom workers. In the archives are many store ads, flyers, PR flyers, also letters. 1950, her boy Nat Abelson sent her a letter in Europe. In 1952, uh, Adam Toole and Company, a letter from one of my mother's cousins, Ida, thanking her for flattering her with a full-figured party dress. There is a 1948 notebook of her designs as well. 
1948, my mother was sent to Paris couture shows for the first time. Her commissionaire was Leslie Caron's aunt. She entered, uh, she continued going to the shows until 1960. My mother incorporated the latest silhouettes and details in her designs. In the archives is our 1952 PR review of a new designer, Hubert de Givenchy. At the time, he was considered a junior designer because he showed voluminous blouses with skirts. He had not become friendly with an influence by Balenciaga at that point. Also, there are many uh, show programs from Dior, Balenciaga, Scaparelli, Michelle Goma, Desai, Balmain. Also, she did, uh, you were not allowed to do sketching in a fashion show, but there were ways <laughs> that you could do a little cheating. And she, you'd see little, you'll see little croquis uh, uh, of a collar she liked or a detail uh, on a, a, a drape that she liked. And after the fashion show, with a very good memory, she would go back to the hotel and sketch what she really liked. Um, when you went to a couture show, there was a fee that was applied to buying a muslin or a garment. My mother, through her, uh, her commissioner, went in through the press so her boss didn't have to buy or spend any money. This didn't last in the 60s, but you could get away with this in the uh, 50s. My mother became very socially friendly with Jack Foth, Pierre Balmain, and Dessay. Nat Abelson called my mother Miss Dior because she bought his samples, mostly suits. Each season in Paris, a couture house would sell its samples at the end of a season and of course it's greatly discounted, and they would uh, fit you. You would have a fitting and they would alter it if need be. But it was a way of not spending a fortune. It was, they were looking to get rid of samples, no different than what uh, designers in America did, uh, and they sold a store called Lowman's in the, the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. It was a discount store, but it was mainly in the beginning samples, and overcuts, and you could get great discounts. Of course, you had to be, if it was samples, small. Right. Uh, uh, she also bought uh, some cocktail gowns from uh, Dior, and she also uh, bought from Balenciaga. Uh, in, your, in the uh, museum collection are a number of her uh, Couture garments, a 1952 uh, navy blue suit, pleated skirt, fitted jacket with a very beautifully draped collar. Also, there uh, uh, is a, from his boutique, a black and white tweed coat dress with a belt with a peplum. So when you wore the belt with the peplum, it gave the illusion of a suit. Also uh, in the archive of the museum is a black satin cocktail dress embroidered. I have in a book, Dior, by Francoise Giraud, is a photograph of the, the coat dress, but this is the couture. Then he made it for his boutique line. Here is the embroidery photographed on velvet, but the, this dress was satin with the same embroidery, which is in the museum archives. My mother was, uh, oh, she also in the archives is a Jack Foth. My mother was cl the closest to Jack Foth, and when he passed away in the late 50s, she went to his funeral. Uh, in the archives is a two-piece gray racing double-knit suit, 
uh, a shrug. If you look at the shrug, there are no seams. It's all draped. And the little stitching that's on it was hand stitching with a slim skirt. Uh, My mother was the only designer of half sizes to ever attend the couture shows. The firm's PR firm was Arlene Fisher, and each season that my mother would go to Paris, after she would promote the dresses that my mother was influenced with details, and they would send them out to stores as promotional uh, promotions, also to get them interested. And then the specialty stores and department stores would also promote uh, that a heavy woman could have a couture-like garment, the latest in-style fashions. Give me a second. Ah, here. Here's an example of one. It's a rayon acetate uh, garment, all tucked from the early 50s. And this is the uh, promotional sketch that the PR woman would send out. Another one, if you notice, the back pleating mm -hmm. on the, the, it's a dress, but it gives the illusion of a suit. The same with this. Again, you'll notice the silhouettes are loose. This is towards the later part of the 50s when very fitted clothing was starting to wane and women found the comfort of not having tight bond binding clothing. Also, very fitted suits and things, no matter what you do, they tend to ride up and they look like hell. Even if it's custom made to you, it's just not uh, something that looks particularly well. Another dress, print, with the draping of the skirt. A brocade, cocktail dress. A very fitted suit. <laughs> 1955. These are all 1955. And a coat dress. Again, something you could totally wear today. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, uh, it's the way my mother designed and the way she dressed. Again, very much like Norel. You could go back 50, 60 years and still wear the clothing. I mean, yes, some of the things are dated, but if you do classic, basic things, they don't really go out of style. If you go over trendy, like today, you go to Paris, the, the couture shows, the ready witch, shows, they make separate lines today, runway shows, which never hits the stores. The showroom has a completely different line. This did not exist in the 50s and 60s. What you saw on the runway is what was produced, and it was meant to fit, to be attractive, to enhance a woman's figure. Today it's a completely promotional thing. In, uh, in 1959, there was a world fair in Moscow, Russia, and my mother's firm was asked to put on a daily fashion show. Included in the archive is a photograph of the top large size model of the day at the airport. In uh, 1960, Women's Wear Daily did an article on my mother, also included in the archives. There are photos of my mother in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, in 1965 photo of my mother in Paris, she's wearing a Norel 1961-62 black and white tweed suit, archive number 2017.8-5. You also have in your archives a large collection of, uh, from the early 50s to the late 60s, of Balenciaga's and uh, Givenchy, which I took out of my mother's magazines because they were cluttering up the house, but I wanted to save all the uh, 
their, their collections. They're from Le Fissier, La Art, La Mode, Vogue, Harper's, small French magazines. Magazines. Let me just add one uh, thing that I didn't do before. When she worked for a uh, casino dress, as I said, she was noted for drape dresses. These are in the archives where you can study them more closely. Nineteen forty. 41 spring, tailored suits. Nineteen forty-two. Arnold Constable ad of a suit, a costume. Arnold Constable being probably another uh, freelance position. No, 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 department store. It was a blo uh, two blocks above Lord and Taylor. They okay. went out of business in the early sixties, I believe. An evening gown from 1940-42 for casino dress. Coat and suit from casino, 1940-41. Here's an ad from um, Lord and Taylor's Manhattan Shop, 1955 of one of my mother's uh, print dresses, retailed for $49.95. If you notice, the back of the dress is where all the detailing is, all pleated. Mm, that's really intricate construction. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in 1950, my mother's line was stolen and she had to recreate the entire collection. Uh, in the archives, you have uh, her sketches, some with swatches on it, uh, and some painted. So what you mean, I think, is that the samples? The sample, the original samples. The original there was no was line stolen. was stolen. The, there was a break-in, and the line was stolen. So she had to fast. So she worked with 40 sample hands to get uh -huh. that line out in time because there was nothing. Did they ever find out more information about what happened? No. They never found out who did it. What It must have been an inside job. I mean, how did they get in? It's not easy. Right. Here are a few of the, of the dresses. If you look, you'll see intricate draping, which was very much in style. But also, my mother realized, these drapes flattered a large woman. If you look at the necklines, they generally are open mm -hmm. to give a longer neck. Skirts could be A-lined, so a woman that was hippie, it would give the illusion she wasn't as big. It also made the waistline look smaller. Again, if you do geometrics, if you take a jacket and you have very large padding and it narrows, it makes a woman's waist look very thin. If you do an A-line skirt, it's going to make the waistline look smaller. So there are little tricks that a designer learns over the years what flatters a woman. Not easy. <laughs> Again, this is only part of her line uh, of what uh, was stolen. Any questions about what you're looking at? They're lovely. <laughs> I'm a little envious. I'll take one of each. <laughs> Afraid not. <laughs> long, long gone. A long time Somebody ago. Did yeah. Take one of these. Again, as you can see, a swatch. Yes. 
1961, my mother wanted to get back to designing Missy clothes. So she resigned. But little did she know she was typecast as a designer for large sizes. She also had been around a long time and was earning a lot of money. She discovered she had limited opportunities. She had, was hired to design for a new firm called Glenhaven, being run by one of her bosses from the 1940s, William Bats. He had been in the coat and suit business. She had worked for him a uh, freelance. It was to be high fashion and better priced. It was a division of a, one of the largest moderate price firms of the day. I don't remember the whole name, but I know the last part was Kaufman. She designed a four line, but her, but her boss decided to retire. The line was sold to one of her old bosses, Leonard Arkin, who she had worked for also in the 1940s. The line sold very well, so my mother asked him for a job but he said he could not hire because she was a half-size designer. She was typecast. There is a saying by manufacturers who were in business for many years, the dress has a built-in horseshoe, which basically means when first designed, it was a tremendous seller. They believe that you keep making the same garment over and over and over, but this is, doesn't work. As styles change, these things are passe, and these many of the big, biggest uh, manufacturers in the 40s and even the 50s were dying out because the mentality was it has a built-in horse show. They'll live off what they did in the past, and they all went out of business. They couldn't understand why. They didn't keep up with the times. My mother uh, also freelanced for a furrier, Lightman Furs, uh, for two seasons. He had been in the fur coat business, but in the early 50s, he was the creator or the inventor of the little cashmere sweater trimmed in fur. Uh, by now, his business had deteriorated tremendously. He did uh, still a nice fur business, but the part that really, he did some ready to wear through the years, and that was a big part of his business, and it just wasn't working anymore. Uh, my mother loved working for him because he gave her complete freedom to do what she wanted. He did make something called, um, what do you call it? Um, sorry. <laughs> ribbon knit dresses, which is, was done by only a few embroidery houses. They took silk chiffon, twisted it like yarn, and then it was woven and it looks like crochet. Uh -huh. So it would be back, uh, say you did a, a, a nude uh, dress, you'd back it in nude. So basically, because you would see through it. Uh, he did a tremendous business with these dresses. And his biggest account was a specialty store, Martha, who was then on 58th Street and Park, and she had a salon in Palm Beach. Uh, again, trimmed in fur, because he's a furrier. So my mother was left to her own devices. And one dress I can remember she did was a ampere dress with a scoop, scoop neckline and little puff sleeve of sable. Ultra-luxurious. Yeah. <laughs> oh, very. These, were, these things in those days cost a thousand or more. Right. Uh, very expensive. She also did uh, a satin halter top with the skirt, which is the crocheted look, boarded in sable, which also came with a stole of the crochet boarded in the sable. Wow. Uh, she did jackets where the sleeves were all fur. Again, it brought her back to her first job with Billy Gordon because very much it had that uh, feeling and look of the combining of right. fur with uh, uh, a garment. Uh, she also designed his fur line for one, uh, for one for, uh, for a line.
My mother then went to work for Youth Guild, owned by Arthur and Vera Lefkowitz. They were a dressy clothes line at that time. My mother introduced day clothes. Uh, their biggest account was Saks Fifth Avenue, and the buyer that bought their line was called Ollie. She was in love with my mother's clothing, but she felt that a lot of the clothes were too young. Now, considering that most manufacturers wouldn't hire my mother because she had designed half sizes, it tells you something. The truth was they weren't too young, they were sophisticated and high fashion, which she was more or less up between a junior and a missy department at Saks at the time. Uh, my mother designed one outfit I can remember was a um, black, uh, a white satin halter top, and the skirt was all ruched, A-line, ruched ribbon, solid, A-line. Skirt was lined in um, tool to give, to give it the yeah. A-line. With it came a stole that reversed from plain silk to the ribbon ruching. She felt this was too young. It came with a, a wide black uh, sti solid stitching, uh, channel stitching belt. She felt this was too young. What it was, it was very high fashion, very sophisticated, not that it was so young. Uh, my mother uh, did very well there, and she became lifelong friends with uh, Vera and Oscar Lefkowitz until they passed away. Um, for interest's sake, uh, Youth Guild next designer was, um, God, what's her name? Um, slipping my mind. She became, um, it'll come back to me. She became one of the biggest sportswear designers. Um, no, no, no. Young, uh, in, the, in the 80s, 90s, they were the biggest on 7th Avenue. Um, oh, um, not about Antine? No, no, no. Um, it'll come to me, I'll get back to it. <laughs> but she went then, to, the business was sold to Jonathan Logan. And uh, they left ultimately, and it, Liz Claiborne. Okay. Yes. It turned out to be then Liz Claiborne's company, which was highly was sportswear. But again, that she started in a dressy firm that she transferred once the firm was sold. And Arthur Lefkowitz went to work for a short time for him. Um, late 1962, my mother received a phone call from. Um, a young salesman who had been trained by Nat Abelson, her former boss, who was now working as head salesman for a firm in 1400 Broadway, Grace Taylor, also a half-size firm. Uh, my mother went to work for the boss, Larry Goldman, uh, and was there from 1962 to 1973. They made tailor clo tailored clothing predominantly and some dressy clothing. Uh, their biggest account was Lane Bryant's designer salon at the time. She worked very closely throughout the years with Lane Bryant. And in 1965, Lane Bryant had decided they wanted her to go to Paris couture shows and make line-for-line -line copies oh, wow. for large women, something that had never been done. Uh, Orbax, which store on 34th Street, which is no longer in business, was the premier copyist of couture clothes. Sidney Gitler bought the, the coats and the suits, and Irene Sachs bought the dresses. Other stores uh, tried, but Orbax was, got all the socialites. Uh, ben Zuckerman made a lot of their clothing, so it was, you know, two, three hundred dollars, you bought a, 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 a suit versus a couple of thousand in Paris, so <laughs> The socialites knew how to save money as well as average, the average customer. Uh, so she went to Paris in 1965, and she, went, uh, she bought at Balenciaga a brown and black tweed suit, and a slim skirt with a, shell, a blouse of black sequins with an overlay of brown chiffon 
and a tweed jacket that went with it. At Givenchy, she bought a, a costume, was a green tweed, jewel neck, sleeveless dress, dropped waist with a Nova jacket. She bought Michelle Goma uh, a silk dress that was draped. She then went to Saint Laurent and she bought one of the Mondrian dresses, the <laughs> Racine knits uh, that they made. They were highly successful. And for two years, they continued uh, sending my mother to Paris to buy uh, again. What they did, if you bought a couture garment, if you brought it into the United States for a longer than, I don't remember the period of time, there was a tremendous duty on it. So generally, manufacturers didn't. They'd bring it in fast, get it out fast, so they didn't have to pay a tremendous duty. In my mother's case, they never shipped the clothes to them, this country. My mother had to sketch and remember what she saw in Paris and redo it in New York. Um, in 1964, my mother was sent to London to work with a dress manufacturer of suits, costumes, and dresses. Uh, she, what she did was she would edit their line, she would select the knits, she would alter the garments, and what she did was eliminate all the darts. Was, they were heavily darted, and now clothes were loosening. And then they were made in London, and her firm would sell them as an addition to her line. Uh, they sold very well, and they became a staple. So twice a year, she would go for, for the spring and fall to uh, do a line. The same year, she was sent for the first time to Hong Kong. This was pre-everybody like today, running to Hong Kong. So we're talking 1965. 64, 65, 65 and began until, uh, until she, uh, she left. Yes. Uh, she uh, would go twice a year, Hong Kong, first to London, then to Hong Kong, mm -hmm. in other words, around the world. And let me tell you, arduous is an understatement to do a whole line in two places mm -hmm. with nothing. Uh, she tried at one point to do patterns in New York for Hong Kong. It didn't really work that well. She had to do from scratch. She had to do the designing of the beading as well. But what she did do, she would go to Paris, and you could go to the beaders and buy swatches, samples, and you would take it, and then you would work with the beaders in Hong Kong and alter and do what you wanted to do. So she did that a couple of times. But generally, she had to literally design the beading herself. Uh, again, the first dresses were knit dresses with beading. The line was so successful that they opened a Missy line. Uh, she did this until 1973. Uh, she, let, uh, she was promised a piece of the business. Not, it was not forthcoming, and that's why she left the firm in 73. Now, I have from 1967 knit directions, uh, a publication for the trade, in which they talk about large size women, and my mother was interviewed. It's called the now fashion scene for the really hippie set. <laughs> Hippies in quotes. <laughs> in quotes, <laughs> correct. Uh, OK, this is a sketch my mother did of one of her dresses. I'll describe it in, uh, in detail in the, in the text. And here's a coat. Also, no darts. Grace Taylor, Miriam Abrams, a smart size for herself, is one designer with feeling, heart, and fashion to offer broad broads. Her things are are bright, brisk, and definitely dated now. There has been an explosion in the fashion industry, which must include large sizes, she says unequivocally. Color is important to a large woman as a small one. 
She wants stripes, plaids, geometrics, all things any other woman wants. It's my job to give her these things in the proper proportion, in lovely slenderizing and young Missy styling. Miss Abrams thinks in elegant, understated terms, an uncluttered, smart look away from the staid. One of the best examples in her thinking is her new bust look, doing away with the dated, deep bust darts for women who are almost always super chesty chicks. She often uses the flattering, long, diagonal side dart, as you saw in the in this dress. Mm -hmm. And works with artistic skill in bias goods on the top. Several of her numbers have a cross stitch front and center that does away completely with the, the bus dart. If you look at the coat, you'll see this does away the needing for a dart. Her collection for the transitional period will include a group of imports from Hong Kong, wool double knits ablaze with luscious hand beading of pearls, tiny beads, rhinestones, and paillettes. The domestic numbers include mylars on wool, acetates, engineered prints. Uh, in the 60s, tremendous was the engineered prints, uh, influenced by Pucci, okay. which he did the silk jerseys, but they were engineered, or they'd be border. You'd see a border at the top, a border at the bottom, and a pattern to the center. Uh, she worked with print houses with her own, designing her own prints. You didn't go out and buy these. You could, but she did it with the uh, prints that she wanted, especially done like positive, negative, mm -hmm. which you couldn't buy. You, were, you had to work with a textile firm. Um, uh, prints, textures, bold stripes, and outsized plaids, all finely detailed with sharp styling and fine workmanship. The lines of Grace Taylor are Soft and flattering included are a number of costumes in both coat and jacket ensembles. Miss Abrams uses heathers with a solid reverse side for coat and dress combos. She has a rich, lighter than royal blue jacket dress creation with a scarf and jacket lining in a brilliant broad stripe of deep violet, bitter green, blue and plum. All her samples, by the way, are two inches shorter than last year. Again, in the half sizes and large sizes, they tended to cut them much longer. Mm -hmm. What she did is she did go up, I'm not mini skirts, but up, but also with three inch turnbacks. So it could you be it let it out or lowered. This you didn't find in moderate price. You found this on, well, 7th Avenue. Some of them did it, particularly Norell. From 1973 until the end of the decade, uh, for the balance of her career, my mother freelanced for some of 7th Avenue's top firms, and you have her sketches. You also have sketches. Uh, we went into business for uh, two seasons. Bloomingdale's put us into business. It was much too much for us to handle on our own, so that... <laughs> We did, that ended, uh, but you have some of the sketches. This was a terracotta cotton tuck dress with a turtleneck that went under it. This was the beginning. It was, we sold to Bloomingdale's, Ann Taylor, Lloyd & Taylor, Macy's, B. Altman's, all the New York stores, yes. Saks Fifth Avenue. But being small, it was really impossible to do it. This is a wool uh, 
brightly striped two-piece t-shirt, scarf, and a, 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 a yoked skirt. A tweed jumper with a striped mm -hmm. Very fun. sweater. And this was a jersey, like silk jersey, red and black stripe, and it was positive negative with the turtleneck, just the opposite of what's on the top. These were a few of the, uh, our own business. You yourself yeah. are also a designer. Yeah, yeah. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, when I finish. Okay. Um, In the 1960, Missy firms cut from a size 4 to a 12, and specials from 14s or 16s, generally not often. The average size was a size 10. Today, in 2018, the average size is larger than a size 14. So today, there is a greater need for stylish, fashionable clothes. Some top name designers now design large size clothes, clothing since there's such a big market. My mother was the first to do this in high fashion for large women in the 1940s on. Still today, it's hard for a large size woman to find fashionable clothes. It's talked about, but there is very little really available, especially fit is a major problem as it's always been. My mother understood if designing a size 4 or a 20 and a half, the most important thing is to flatter the wearer and camouflage figure flaws. Fit, cut, and proportion of a garment are paramount, and to use beautiful fabrications. This she learned as a young designer, and it made her very successful for 50 years. The garment industry is very much like show business. It's very rough with longevity, not part of it. When a business turns down, as it does at times, and sales go down from your last collection, the first person fired is the designer. Very few designers have longevity. I'm talking about designers that are employed, not designers that end up in their own business. Again, also there are designers that end up in their own business and they're only good at a certain style for a certain period of time and then they end up out of business. What my mother did the last few years of her career, she did do freelance work for some of the top 7th uh, Avenue houses, but she decided that she didn't want to do that either. She did consulting with moderate price houses where she did the merchandising. She did the fabrications. She told them of the styles, of the trends that were going on. And she would work with the designer, basically designing without doing the, the real work. Again, here are a few of the things she did in the, in the 70s for 7th Avenue houses and Broadway houses. Again, if you notice, Many of these, which are now mm, close to 50 years ago, can still be worn. Absolutely. She's really fascinating because she had such a varied career. Yeah. And she worked with everybody. In everybody, yeah. Especially in the 30s and 40s with the freelance. And she worked with, again, as I said, they worked three-month uh, sessions to do a collection and you would move on. Again, they could call you back if they wanted you, but it was a way of saving money. It, you know, it's no different than you find a lot of ma smaller manufacturers, they'll hire a designer, employ them for a season, then fire them. Right, right. Uh, again, it, things haven't radically changed. It's just a little bit different than it used to be. And again, uh, with the 60s and designers starting to get credit, a lot of designers were able to end up in their own business. Unfortunately for my mother, she wasn't a businesswoman. She was a designer. She had opportunities 
to go into business, turn them all down. And when she really wanted it, it was too late, basically. Her boss, Nat Abelson, knew how to make her happy. And that was enough. Again, if she'd been a businesswoman, she would have been in her own business. Right. Again, uh, these are all great. These are her own sketches. Own, all her own sketches. Her style changed over time, which is interesting. Uh, as I said, to survive from 19, late 20s to uh, close 1980, you had to be able, adaptable to change with styles. As I said, there are many designers that are just not capable. Yeah. There's a period that they are very creative, but that's as far as they go. Mm -hmm. I could name names, but I guess <laughs> you don't want me to name names. I mean, there have been, you know, very highly publicized designs that don't survive. You really have to know how to change, because fashion is change. Absolutely. And, definition of it. Yeah. I mean, it's a business, and you can't keep... Now, there are exceptions, like Norell, which we will get into. He made a career out of being able to change, but he had basic styles, a sailor dress, mm -hmm. a jumper. A blouse with a huge bow. <laughs> a, a blouse, yeah. He knew how to update it from year to year, and even women that loved his clothes, it didn't matter because it looked completely different. It's changing the fabrications. Mm -hmm. It's going soft, knowing how to go soft like this, a chiffon, when you need to go soft. Uh, this is, and also, he, he, like my mother, they were both capable of designing very tailored clothing, mm -hmm. constructed clothing, or softer clothing. He could do chiffons, which was not his specialty. But again, he lasted from the 20s until his death in 72. I guess it gives you an idea. She did jumpsuits. Yeah. <laughs> she did jumpsuits in this, in, in the, even in the late 60s. She was doing for the half sizes. She did jumpsuits, a few wow. jumpsuits. She also did some tennis wear yeah. for large women. So you worked with your mother? No. Briefly? Briefly, very briefly. Mm -hmm. Just. Peruse. That's now. I do. I work for my ex boss and his wife. I do custom. Uh, I work with the pattern maker. The things are made in Italy because I worked in Italy. Uh, it's made by uh, one of Valentino's uh, sample hands. <laughs> So Most you of it. Grew up in fashion, and yeah. then you transitioned into making jewelry first. Is that Correct. Um, did you go to Did you study? Uh, did you go to school to study jewelry making? Or? No, but in high school, uh, we had crafts, and there was I made jewelry. Mm -hmm. I did, but I did mostly enameling, mm -hmm. and. Uh, And I did something called applique jour, which is enameling without a back. It's like a stained glass window. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, I did do jewelry as well. So uh, when you're doing this particular technique, was it more for decorative art objects versus jewelry? Just what I loved. Okay. Uh, it wasn't planned as anything, it just mm -hmm. I was very good at it. I had things that were exhibited in Russia. They sent my things all over. It looks like cloisonné. It is cloisonné. Yeah. I have cloisonné, but I can't... Uh, you want to get it first? Yeah. Oops, you, you, you lost I know, I see both you. of us. <laughs> These were done when I was about 13. Oh, okay. These were exhibited in Russia. Beautiful. Here's your cloisonne. Mm -hmm. The technique that I did, usually cloisonne, you build up the enameling to the surface. I never did that. Mm -hmm. I, did, I had my own, and I would mix opaque with transparent. 
to give uh, depth and things, which it's not traditional. No, I would, it was uh, something that I loved that I did to do. No, medieval, I, 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 art history yeah. like you. Yeah, but the, the Byzantine feeling? Yeah. Those two pieces that you showed us? Yeah. It's That's a, definitely medieval. It's, <laughs> it's a music box oh. here. And silver, I did do jewelry. A pill box. Oh, really lovely. Enameled inside. So that's what I did from uh, eighth grade through 11th. And as, as, as the teacher said, I should have been a monk in the Middle Ages. <laughs> but uh, I, I ended up going, we had a friend from the Philippines. She came to New York, and at that time, the 70s, puka shells were in style. And that was from her country, so she said, could you help me? I looked at it, I said, oh, what god-awful junk this is. And uh, I got an appointment at Macy's. The buyer was flabbergasted, you know, at how cheap, and sold. And then uh, she went on her own, and I said, God, if she can do this, well, I can do this as well. So. Uh, I knew an antique dealer that I had bought things from, uh, so I went rummaging. Uh, he had parts from chandeliers, gilt bronze doorway from furniture. I converted it into jewelry. Uh, I had Japanese tobacco uh, pipe cases with the little bags. So the buyer that put us in business at Bloomingdale's was in cul-de-sac. A small jewelry section. Elsa Peretti was there as the beginning. It's, this goes away. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so I started selling her. I then uh, got a whole department at Banwatella. It was my first big, big sale. And uh, did, I did some jewelry also, one of a kind pieces, um, but I was expensive. Can you tell me what date we're talking about? 1970, hmm, about four, okay. somewhere around there. Um, and then I sold a few others, so it was very difficult. What I did is I would booklet each piece. What it was was I used to buy antique Chinese necklaces, strip it, use parts of it in the necklaces so it would be affordable, but I was expensive. They didn't know how to sell. You really needed someone that understood how to sell these things. They man, I did antique lacquer bags, boxes for evening bags. I started that trend. Uh, I also started uh, selling Mary McFadden. A lot of her stuff, uh, she bought the lacquer bags for her shows. She bought uh, some of the jewelry she copied. Uh, I sold her antique fabrics I collected. She framed them beautifully, and she put them in Bonwitz Salon, uh, Bendel Salon, in her home. So I did quite a bit. I worked for Jeffrey Bean. I did things. I did for all the top people. Um, now, here is, uh, and my biggest promoter was Andre Leon Talley of Women's Wear Daily. He was the uh, editor of Accessories. So every two or three weeks, I was up there, and he was photographing and giving me publicity. He said, of all the people that he worked with, he got the greatest response from my things. Here's one of the write-ups. Now, you have in uh, the Norel uh, manuscript, I put these, I, a little publicity for myself. <laughs> the, the, I, I figured I deserve it. I'll go down in history in your archives. I might as well put something in. Women's Wear Daily, yeah. Uh, here, um, well, the pictures are not very good, but uh, the top one is crystal, a uh, tortoiseshell. Looks like tortoiseshell. I made it as a belt or a necklace. The one under it is a 
19th century uh, Peking glass gourd shape, and I twisted it with cording and tassel for, and as you see, he, they, he added the uh, Saint Laurent clothing right. because I was ethnic, and his jewelry, uh, Lulu de la Fleur's, uh, everything she did was ethnic also. Okay, something like this. What I did, I discovered I was, I started something called, I called it belt jewelry. I had trouble selling department stores, uh, jewelry departments. They resisted. You couldn't get in, basically. So I figured, well, as long as I'm doing wrappings, call it belt jewelry, sell it to the belt department, booklet it, that it could be worn as a necklace or a belt, it worked. I started with something called goat skin, which is a piping, was, comes from goats, and I would make wrappings, and everybody was copying me. And I said, I was expensive. I wholesale from mm, $8 to uh, about $60, $70, which then was money. Um, I was selling Bonwits, I was selling Bloomingdale's, I was selling Lloyd and Tail, I was selling Macy's, I was selling Altman's, basically every store in the city. Uh, I then got to women's wear, special, some specialty stores throughout the country. They ended up being, in the long run, the best clients because they would sell it with a garment mm -hmm. and it becomes volume versus just sitting there. Uh, I then realized everyone's copying me. I used to get from Blumenthal, which is a button house that designers went to, I used to use buttons for these wrappings as decorations. They were copying me. I said, I have to do something to get inexpensive where I can get some volume. I got a um, contractor that made all of Judith Lieber's tassels that she would apply to her evening bags. Well, if you look at this room, the length you'd have to fill a machine up, otherwise he couldn't work with you. So at first he wouldn't work with me. He liked my mother. So finally he did work with me, so we made an arrangement. Whatever I would do, he couldn't use for one year. So basically it was with a chainette, twisted, because he did all the military uh, things that go around the arm, and limited again. Uh, but I was a, I did jute mixed with the gold, so it would be bra twisted, it looked braided, and I could sell it for $6 wholesale. I ended up getting a volume after a few years of um, close to a million dollars. Yeah. And let me tell you, I knew this business was not going to last. I didn't have a strong foundation, but I knew with that kind of money you save every penny that's coming in so you don't, you know, you have for the future. And that's basically how I ended up in uh, the jewelry business. But I it really ended up in the belt business. Yeah. How long did that? Uh, how long I did was that? in business, I would say, from about 74 to the early 80s. Okay. My mother, as I explained to you, developed Alzheimer's. It got too much. I then gave up the de department stores completely, the buyer at Saks left. The buyer from Bonwitz that bought scarves was hired. She hated me because I got all her money for the belt department. They took away from her department. She wouldn't buy from me. I mean, you, I learned what you run into. Bonwitz went out of business, so I was predominantly working with specialty stores. What they would do is I would uh, see what they bought, and then I would make colors accordingly for their dresses, the belts, mm -hmm. and I did some jewelry but it became just, it was overwhelming. I had taken care of my mother, and that was more than I could handle, so I phased out. And as I said, fortunately, I had made a lot of money. And that was basically it. Then when my mother died in 93, a friend of mine from Italy introduced me to somebody that was in the dress business. And, that and that's, yeah, well, yeah, that's, no, this, uh, well, this leads to, um, they, uh, it leads that I worked in Italy. He was uh, a vertical setup, a knitwear, mm -hmm. predominantly. 
he, nothing was uh, sold in America. It was for European market. I started design. I never did knitwear. And we're talking with the machines I knew from nothing, but I worked with the technicians uh, with what I liked and developed a dress business and did it for a number of years. But I have a very bad back. And twice I ended up in the hospital in Italy, and I, that basically was time to call it a day, especially after five years ago when I had surgery. What I do now, I design for his wife and his daughter. His daughter married an American, and they live here. And he comes back. He, he did go out uh, when business was very bad. He closed up his factories, and he has big interests all over. But I used to go on the Concorde to Paris. He would pick me up in his plane, take me to Italy, and I'd stay for a month or two designing the line. What I do now is design for his wife and his daughter. His daughter had been a model. So these are some of what I've been doing for them. As I said, uh, and are they um, manufacturing? No, no, no. This is personally? you call this couture personally, personally. Yeah. mostly for the daughter, some for the mother. I did her wedding. She had two weddings: one in uh, um, Italy, and then one in New York. She had a Catholic wedding in uh, in. Uh, Rome, and then she married a Jewish man here, and then they had a Jewish ceremony in New York. And I've been designing for them, for the family, ever since. What I do is I work with a pattern maker. I have one sample hand that can do some of it. I source my fabrics, everything's from Europe. I do the beading, uh, I tell them what I want, basically. Not that I do that much beading. Uh, a lot of the things that are not simple, as I said, uh, they have uh, one, of, uh, one or two of Valentino's sample hands mm -hmm. that carry out. In other words, they get a perfect muslin. The muslins are fitted here on well, a mannequin that's built out to their measurements. And I do everything. As you can see, some of them are uh, fur trim coats. I've done fur line coats. They have a furrier that they work with there. So everything, uh, it's complicated, but it works. Thank you so much. This is so lovely. I think we've left, come full, full circle yes. in a bit. <laughs> so you more or less now know what I do in between yes. to keep myself busy. <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you so much. That My was pleasure. terrific and wonderful. And anybody who's going to look at the collection is going to be more than thrilled to get all that additional layer of information um, from the oral history. And if you have any other questions, the next time we do finish up with Norel, you can ask me additional questions. Absolutely. All this right. was a pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you so Thank much. You. <laughs>